Welcome to Lesson 9F, Stokes First Problem, Part 4. In this lesson, we'll finally finish our example similarity solution, namely Stokes First Problem, by calculating and discussing the vorticity field. We'll also talk about vorticity production and diffusion. This is the fourth lesson in this series, so I'll just very quickly remind you that we're talking about an infinite wall that is impulsively started at t equals zero. In our previous lessons, we solved for v, the y component of velocity, the pressure field, and the x component of Navier-Stokes reduced to these two terms, which we solved using similarity variables, getting two ODEs, solving the first one for delta, and then the second one for the x component of velocity as a function of y and time, which when plotted looks something like this. The boundary condition at the wall is capital U, and it decays down to zero at some delta, but this universal profile just stretches as time increases. I emphasize that this is a universal similarity solution, valid for any y, t, and kinematic viscosity nu, provided that the flow remains laminar. Now let's look at vorticity in this problem. The vorticity vector is 0, 0, omega z, since our flow is in the xy plane only. But you may recall that omega z in Cartesian coordinates is del v del x minus del u del y, and v equals zero by continuity, so omega z is simply minus del u del y. So we need to plug in u from up here into this equation, taking the y derivative. Thus omega z is minus del del y of u minus u erf y over two square root of nu t. But u is a constant, so its derivative is zero. Thus we rewrite omega z is two u over square root of pi, del del y of the error function, which we will write out by its definition with this upper limit. Well, now we have to take the partial y derivative of this integral. How do we do that? Well, recall our old friend Leibniz theorem, which is relevant here since y appears in the upper limit of the integral and we're taking the y derivative. I write Leibniz theorem here, which has these three terms. Let's evaluate these derivatives and other terms. In our equation, a equals zero, b equal y over two square root of nu t, dA dy is therefore zero, and dB dy is one over two square root of nu t. Function capital F is e to the minus psi squared from here, and del capital F del y is zero. So this term is zero because of this, and this term is zero because of this, but the middle term remains. Therefore, omega z is 2u over square root of pi from up here, and then this term comes from Leibniz. Combining some of the constants, we have omega z is u over square root of pi nu t, e to the minus y squared over 4 nu t. This is our equation for vorticity in Stokes' first problem. Two quick comments. We can call this grouping of terms omega z wall, since at the wall where y equals zero, the exponential term goes away, and we're left with this. So omega z is omega z wall, e to the minus y squared over four nu t. But you can see that omega z wall decays with time. In fact, it behaves like one over square root of time. My other comment is that del omega z del y, taking the derivative, is u over square root of pi nu t, e to the negative y squared over four nu t, times the derivative of that exponent, negative two y over four nu t. And I point out that at the wall, where y equals zero, the slope of vorticity is zero, at the wall for all time greater than zero. Uh, but, sir, I seem to recall in our previous lesson you said that in order for vorticity to be produced at a wall, there must be a pressure gradient in the flow direction. But here, nothing is a function of x, so del p del x must be zero. And you also said that there must be a vorticity gradient at the wall in the normal direction for there to be vorticity production. But you just showed us that del omega z del y is zero at the wall. So, sir, where and how is vorticity produced in this problem? Great question, Sean. That was back in lessons 6c and 6d, if anyone wants to look back. It turns out that for any time greater than zero, you're correct. 
LP del X is zero, and the vorticity gradient normal to the wall is also zero. Thus, vorticity is not being produced at the wall. But our previous discussion was limited to steady flows. This flow is unsteady. In fact, it has a sudden discontinuity at time zero. It turns out that unsteadiness is another way to produce vorticity at the wall. Uh, thank you, sir. That explains it. So let's talk about vorticity production. At time t equals zero, there's no flow, and the wall is stationary. But the wall's speed becomes capital U impulsively at t equals zero. This introduces a vortex sheet, sudden discontinuity of speed from U to zero in an infinitesimal distance. Because of that instantaneous vortex sheet, del U del Y at the wall is infinite, namely negative infinity. And since omega Z is minus del U del Y, omega Z is positive infinity at the wall at time t equals zero. Some people like to say at zero plus meaning the instant that this wall started moving. So in terms of vorticity, we have introduced what mathematicians call a delta function of vorticity into the flow at t equals zero. In other words, from a vorticity point of view, we have an infinite spike of vorticity, which has infinite height but zero thickness, which is the definition of a delta function. And we know that omega z is positive since it's defined positive counterclockwise. Mathematically, a finite amount of vorticity is dumped into the flow at the instant when the wall starts moving. This, of course, is an unsteady problem, and it actually produces vorticity. Delta functions have an area under the curve. We're used to thinking about delta functions vertically, where we have this sort of Gaussian-shaped distribution that is infinite in height, but zero in width, but there is an area associated with it. The same thing's true here, except it's oriented 90 degrees to the right. If we plot vorticity as a function of distance from the wall y and time, we have the delta function at t equals zero. At some later time, call it t1, we have a curve that looks like that, and we have a universal similarity profile again, so that these curves all have a similar shape, but they stretch vertically by diffusion, and omega z at the wall decreases with time. It turns out that the area under any of these curves is constant. This green area is the same as the area under this curve, or even the area of the delta function. Notice also that at any time, del omega z del y at the wall is zero, which you may recall means there's no vorticity production at the wall. There is diffusion, of course, as time increases, so vorticity diffuses upwardly into the flow, but there's no vorticity production. So to answer Sean's question, all the vorticity is added suddenly, instantaneously, at t equals zero. An omega z wall is infinite at t equals zero. Then vorticity diffuses in the y direction away from the wall for all times greater than zero. It also turns out that vorticity diffuses with thickness delta proportional to square root of nu t, just like the u component of velocity diffuses from previous lessons where delta is some measure of the thickness, such as the 99% thickness. This would be delta T1, delta T2, and delta T3 on our diagram. As I said, the area under the vorticity curve is constant. All the vorticity is dumped into the flow at time t equals zero, and there's no production of vorticity after that. It simply diffuses with time. So can we calculate this constant area? In other words, the area under the vorticity curve at any time t. Well, the area is the integral from zero to infinity of omega z dy. And since omega z dy reduced to minus del u del y, we write this integral, which is actually a trivial integral. It's just negative u evaluated from y equals zero at the wall to y equal infinity far above the wall. Well, at y equal infinity, u is zero. The effect of the wall hasn't diffused up that high yet. And at the wall, little u is capital U, so this reduces to capital U. We can state then that the area under the vorticity curve at any time greater than zero is equal to capital U, where U is the speed at which the wall impulsively started. 
In other words, the total integrated vorticity is a constant equal to capital U. And with this, we are finally finished with Stokes' first problem. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.